I'd like to introduce all of you uh, to Elizabeth Schamberger. She is uh, the president of Moonstone Environmental located in the Lehigh Valley region. It is a woman-owned business and she's been recognized by the Lehigh Valley Business Journal as one of the Lehigh Valley's women of influence. She's also an officer of CREW, which is the Commercial Real Estate Women Network, as well as the Urban Land Institute, which we talk about often. She's got a wealth of information, uh, experience, knowledge, and the only negative is that she went to, to uh, Princeton instead of Lehigh. But today she's joining us to discuss environmental assessments for commercial real estate transactions for development and redevelopment. So welcome. I'm, I'm really glad you were able to join us this morning, and I'm looking forward to anything you can share with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It's nice to see those of you I can see. Uh, I want to start by congratulating you all for being smart enough to take real estate classes in college. It's, you know, you become an adult and you find out that real estate is where a lot of um, money resides and where a lot of interesting municipal decisions are made. And it's, it's very influential in day-to-day -day life. So I just congratulate all of you for having the foresight to take this class. I think it's really going to help you even if you don't end up in real estate. Um, at some point, you're gonna buy a house, you're gonna buy an apartment, you're gonna do something real estate related, and this will be really valuable to you. So um, I put together a slideshow just to talk a little bit about environmental concerns in real estate development. And I'll just kind of go through the slides. If at any point you have a question, feel free to jump in, just unmute and you know, talk loud enough that I can hear you, all right? With that, we'll just get going. I have been assured that I do not need to fill up the entire class. So we'll, we'll aim for short. All right, here we go. Okay, so there's uh, some of my contact information at the bottom if you have any questions. I'm gonna start with some definitions just because otherwise I'm gonna be using words that you may or may not be familiar with and I'd rather you understand what they are. So a brownfield, most of the work I do involves brownfields. A brownfield is a property that has real or perceived environmental impairments, which might make it less desirable to a potential purchaser. Most people think of it as being a site that definitely has problems, but it's important here that word or perceived because sometimes we'll go to a site that looks like this one and actually find out that it's pretty clean. And in that case, that can be a big win for a a real estate developer or an investor because the, the property tends to be less expensive because it looks scary, but it's actually not a big remediation cost. The other end of the spectrum on that is sometimes you can buy a property like this and it has major problems environmentally that do become very expensive and it becomes prohibitive to redevelop it. And um, at the end of this, I'm gonna circle back around to brownfields and sort of the whole theory of why would anyone buy one? But for now, I just wanted you to be aware of what a brownfield is. So it's a, a real or perceived environmental impaired property. Okay, a phase one environmental site assessment is the thing, if you're in real estate, you'll probably come across most frequently. It is basically a book report on a property. As you can see, it's an ASTM standardized document. ASTM tells us exactly what needs to be included and what doesn't need to be included. They even recommend the format for the report. The purpose of the phase one is to look at the history of the site, do a site inspection, look around, talk to people who are familiar with the property and evaluate if we think there are likely to be any problems. But I call it a book report because it doesn't involve any sampling. So we're not really confirming or, or, or figuring out where things are or even if they exist. It's sort of suspicions. So if I find out that a site has an underground storage tank on it, I'm gonna be suspicious that they might have a problem and I might make recommendations for further investigation based on that. If you do further investigation, it's called, and I'm sure you can all predict what comes after the phase one, the phase two. Phase two environmental site assessment is where we start doing the fun stuff. That's where we start sampling. Typically for environmental work, that will mean soil sampling and possibly groundwater sampling. So the picture on the left is a groundwater monitoring well. So if you're out at a site and you see a small manhole cover like that, that's maybe six inches across, uh, it should be labeled monitoring well. 
They are not always labeled that way, but that is a well that's installed into the groundwater aquifer to look for contamination in the groundwater. And then on the right side, that is uh, one example of how we sample for soil. That was a hand auger that we drilled into the ground and we're screening it for volatile chemicals. And then we'll take some of that soil, put it in a jar and send it to the lab for analysis. There are other types of sampling we can do. We can actually sample soil gas, which is the, the vapor that is between the soil particles. That becomes important if you have a spill of something like dry cleaning solvent that is very volatile and it can actually move the vapors through the soil and those vapors can come up into a building and create a problem with indoor air quality. So sometimes we would also sample that soil vapor. Um, and sometimes we do also sample surface water, maybe sediments and things like that. So phase two is really anything where you're doing active data collection and sampling. Remediation, okay, so those of us in my field call it remediation. I've heard some people in other fields call it phase three. Uh, that's fine, call it whatever you want as long as you understand what it means. And that's the remediation step. So that's actually cleaning it up. So obvious examples, physical removal is one way to do it. So on the left, you see us removing a, I think that's an eight or 10,000 gallon underground storage tank. That, that would be typical of what you would see at a gas station. This one happened to be heating oil for a really large uh, manufacturing facility, but that size is typically what they would have at a gas station. <clears throat> we are removing the tank. So we are removing the source of the contamination. And then we dug around in that excavation to remove the contaminated soil as well. That's a commercial example. On the right side, I have a picture of a residential example. That uh, small white tank that's located behind the guy standing there was the kerosene tank that the homeowner used to heat their home. They had a line break on it and it spewed kerosene all over the soil and it ran down towards their house and saturated the foundation, the concrete foundation on their house. They first became aware of this when their entire house inside smelled like kerosene and they were getting nauseated. So that's another example. We needed to remove that soil so that they wouldn't have those fumes in their house anymore. So we're excavating all the soil from right up against the house to remove the kerosene contamination. So those are examples of physical removal, which is really intuitive, but there are other ways that you can remediate where it's more, it's kind of semantics. One is risk assessment. And in risk assessment, you have identified contamination, but instead of removing it, you evaluate how much risk is there really to the people there or to the environment. And if you can demonstrate that there's really no risk, you might be able to leave it there. Um, an example would be if it's a property that is very remote, say, and there's nobody ever going to be on it, and there's lead in the soil. As long as you can document nobody's ever going to be there and that lead's not going anywhere, it's not going to hurt anyone, then maybe it can stay. Um, risk assessments get very involved, and I'm not going to go into them today. Another thing you can do is uh, use controls, which are engineering and institutional controls. And I'll be talking about those a little later, but essentially you are putting controls around the project to keep it safe. And engineering controls are gonna be things like caps, um, you know, paving over something that's contaminated would be an engineering control. Institutional controls are things like, we know the groundwater is contaminated, but nobody's drinking it because the city has an ordinance requiring everyone to connect to city water. So that, that's a case where that ordinance is preventing people from being exposed to your contaminated water. All right, I feel like I'm getting a little into the weeds, so we will move on. Abatement is a term you may come across in real estate, and it, it's really just a special term that's used for remediation of asbestos and lead-based paint. So these aren't materials that are in the environment, they're materials that are in your building. And I don't know why they call it abatement, but abatement just means you are taking the lead paint and taking the asbestos either out of the building or again, you can encapsulate it and leave it there. Sometimes that's better. So for, for example, for lead paint, if you have 300 windows in your building and every window has lead paint on the windowsills, 
removing it is extremely cost prohibitive. So you can paint over it with a non-lead based paint and that's considered abatement, okay? So abatement is like removing it from exposure and not necessarily removing it from the building. Okay, <clears throat> digging in a little on a phase one since this is the thing you're probably gonna see the most. This is the, the first paragraph of the ASTM standard. It's a lot of legalese and I'll let you spend some quality time with it later. But the thing I wanna draw your attention to is the highlighted part. So this practice, which means the practice of doing a phase one, is intended to permit a user, and a user is whoever asked for the phase one, to satisfy one of the requirements to qualify for innocent landowner, contiguous property owner, or bona fide prospective purchaser limitations on CERCLA liability. I don't know if any of you are going into law. <laughs> I, I have to read these things like eight times before they make sense to me. Essentially what this is saying is, if you do the phase one and the other things that are involved with an all appropriate inquiry, investigation, you are granted some protections under CERCLA, which is the federal laws, um, think Superfund. So <clears throat> if you don't do a phase one on a property and there ends up being any kind of federal liability under Superfund or under CERCLA in any other manner, you can be liable for that because you didn't do the phase one and get these protections, these landowner liability protections. So this is why people do phase ones. Just in case it becomes a CERCLA issue, you would want this protection in your pocket. This is huge in terms of the dollar amount it could represent. Um, so not every project is gonna be a Superfund site, right? And when I started doing this 20 years ago, I was asking attorneys, well, this little gas station on the corner is not gonna be a Superfund site, or even this, this residence is not gonna be a Superfund site. Why do we need to do a phase one? Does anyone wanna take a stab at that? Okay, crickets. So the answer I got was, because it is used for Superfund liability protections, it has become just the professional standard, the industry standard, that if you want to show you did things right in your due diligence, you do a phase one. It's just the industry accepted standard for due diligence on a new property. So can I ask you a quick question? While you're, uh, so if uh, someone had accidentally dumped, well, or on purpose, whatever, dumped oil on the property at some point in the past, but there was never a record of it, so we don't know that it's actually there and we don't do a phase two, the buyer of the property purchases the property as a phase one done, are they still as liable for that oil that's underground maybe seeping over time into a water supply, or are there some limitations because they did the phase one? No, the, the phase one protects you for whatever was identified that you know is there and a phase two, like any environmental due diligence that you do ahead of your purchase, it's whatever you identify there that you're basically getting protection for because otherwise there's no way to prove that you didn't spill that oil after you took title. True, okay. So in Pennsylvania, when you purchase a property, you purchase the contamination as well, it becomes yours. <clears throat> so unless you have anything specified in your contract or you have some sort of escrow account or anything like that, if you just purchase a property, you're buying whatever contamination is there. And the only protection you're gonna have is if it was identified in a phase one and you maybe investigated it or you required that the seller clean it up before you buy it. Got it. And then if down the road you found out that the seller cleaned it up from the soil and then you went ahead thinking it was fine and later you find out that it was in groundwater, that you're probably looking at a third party lawsuit. That, you know, that would be between the buyer and the seller that probably DEP wouldn't get involved. DEP, well, I can tell you, DEP will go after the owner, whoever owns the property today, right. that's who the department will go after. I'm sorry, DEP is Department of Environmental Protection. <clears throat> 
Um, so they'll go over the land after the landowner because legally the landowner is who's responsible. And then it would be up to the landowner to sue the previous owner for not having cleaned it up thoroughly if they agreed to clean it up. Got it. <clears throat> okay, so on a phase one, the basic process is there's what's called a user questionnaire. Again, the user is whomever asks for the phase one. It's typically the buyer, person's gonna buy a property, they ask for it and we send them a questionnaire and it's, it's almost laughably simple. It asks things that say like, are you familiar with any contamination at the site? Uh, is it listed for its fair market value? And typically the answers are all no, 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 and yes, it's the fair market value. So typically a user is asking for a phase one because they don't know much about the property. So giving them a questionnaire is, it's a hoop we have to jump through, but it's usually pretty pointless. Um, then the consultant will do interviews with people who are familiar with the property, typically the occupant, whoever's there right now. And if we can, we look at past occupants, the site history, and we have ways of looking back at the site history. And we have to go back to either, I think it's 1940 or whenever the site was first developed. And around here, when the site was first developed is typically the late 1800s. So we are going back and looking at historical topographic maps, historical aerial photographs. Um, sometimes we can find what are called fire insurance maps. And those are very detailed drawings of cities that show every building and, and lots of really minute detail about them, which is great, but they're only available for cities. Um, and sometimes if we are desperate and can't find anything else, we'll do a title search all the way back. Um, and we're just trying to get a hold there of what has been there before. So even if it looks okay today, maybe 20 years ago, it was a junkyard. And maybe 50 years ago, it was a gas plant. So that's why we have to look back. We also look at environmental databases. Those are recordings. Those are databases that keep track of like, who has a regulated tank? Who had a tank leak? Who's a dry cleaner? <laughs> um, who is shipping hazardous materials from their place? Who has hazardous materials in use day to day in their process? So we look at those databases, it sort of gives us an idea of how high risk a site is. And it also tells us about the properties around that site. So um, before most of you got on, Mr. Kime and I were just talking about you could have a site and right across the street is a dry cleaner and across the street kitty corner is a gas station. Those are both high risk sites and they could affect your site. So that's why we look at those environmental databases. And last but not least, we do a site inspection to evaluate the current conditions. And there are specific things that we look for during those site inspections. <clears throat> okay, uh, then we would issue a report that identifies any recognized environmental conditions. And that recognized environmental conditions is a defined term in the standard, as is business environmental risk, defined term. A rec is sort of the big ticket item. Like those are things that we look at and go, that could be a problem. You might wanna look into that. And then business environmental risks are things that, like the regulatory agency wouldn't require you to look into it, but as a business owner, it might cost you money. So environmental, the recognized environmental conditions, RECs, are things like in the backfield, there's a circle where all the grass is dead and nothing is growing. Okay, that indicates something bad happened there. Something's killing that grass. So we would wanna investigate that, maybe take some samples and find out what happened. Another example would be if somebody has an underground tank and they say that tank's been there for like 70 years. We stopped using it 10 years ago. Okay, so it may have corroded, it may have leaks in it and it may be leaking into the ground. So that would be another recognized environmental condition. Those are things that are pretty definite releases to the environment of contamination. So that's why they become a wreck. Business environmental risks are a little more manageable. They're things like you have a big tire pile in the backyard. Somebody's gonna to have to pay to remove those tires and dispose of them, but it's not really a threat to the environment, but it's considered a business environmental risk because it, it creates a cost for the owner. 
And then that the report in the phase one would usually include recommendations for further work. So sometimes in rare cases, we will have a rec that we say you don't need to do anything further. Most of the time, if we have a rec, we would recommend that you need to go to phase two and do some sampling or do some extra research. Okay, so here I'd like to have a little conversation if, uh, if you guys can unmute and speak up a little bit, because this is something that I find interesting and I don't have solid answers. So I, I would like to hear what you think. Phase one is usually required by lenders for commercial property transactions. Almost 100% of the time, if it's a commercial transaction, they want a phase one. It is not required for residential transactions. So why do you think that is? Because it's a lower use on the, uh, or of like the property that usually would result in less like uh, contamination. Like you're probably, it's more likely that on a commercial property, you would have some kind of waste that you could be dumping than on some kind of a, a residential property where just a family lives. Great. Yeah, I think that is probably the primary reason, and that's a, that's a very good answer. Um, anybody else? Commercial properties would probably affect more people, and that could result in like a lawsuit or something like that, whereas residential transactions only affect like one family or a few people. Okay, excellent. Excellent point. Anybody else? Okay, I'll throw another question out there. Can you think of any good reason we should do them on residential properties? Maybe for um, identifying like what was built before that residential property. So, uh, excuse me, so like in case like maybe like a commercial property was built and it was destroyed for residential property. You might want to take a look at that maybe. Exactly, exactly. This is why I find it interesting that we don't do residential transactions. So I think um, that first answer, I think it was James said, residential property is not likely to have the contamination because people aren't going out and dumping gross things in their backyard. But what was it before? So to Justin's point, there are, uh, there's some subdivisions up near where Mr. Kime and I live that are beautiful, lovely rural subdivisions. And as such, they never did any phase one investigation before they put them in. So the builder bought the land, put up the houses, everything's great. Then Walmart decided that they wanted to put a Walmart on 309. Well, they're commercial, so they have to do some investigation. They do a phase one, they do a phase two, and they find out that because the entire region used to be apple orchards, it is now contaminated with arsenic. This leads people in the residential properties to go, well, wait a minute, this used to be an orchard too. And they start looking into it and lo and behold, everyone in the neighborhood has arsenic contamination in their drinking water and in their backyards. So this is just kind of a thought experiment. You know, it's, it's my, personal soapbox, I really think maybe we should be requiring these, not for, not for everyone who's going to buy a house, but if a builder is gonna buy a large chunk of land to build houses, I think you can argue that that's commercial, that's his business. And that maybe we should be doing a little bit of investigation there. Um, so- You know, we've actually, we've actually had situations over the years, uh, probably half a dozen times, where they found an abandoned oil tank in the yard uh, of a residential property that the owner swears they didn't know existed. They had had gas or electric or something for the last 15 years and did not know there was an oil tank buried in the backyard. Right. And sometimes there can even be situations where it has been residential and it's okay, but the guy had a, an auto shop that he ran out of his garage. And when he had oil or grease or 
cleaning solvent, he would just dump it down the sink and they have a septic tank. Well, now their septic leach field has been receiving all kinds of petroleum and solvents and things over the years that can cause contamination too. So residential properties are much less likely to be contaminated, but they're not immune from it. And the argument I would make in favor of doing a little more testing for residential properties is that's where the children live. And that's why in most states, it's certainly the case in Pennsylvania, there's two different sets of environmental regulatory standards. There's one for residential properties and one for commercial properties. The numbers that you have to meet for a residential property are much lower than for a commercial property because those children are smaller, the lower body weight means less contamination affects them more. They're growing, so we don't wanna mess with their systems while they're growing. Um, so, and they're, they also tend to like be closer to the ground. They ingest more dirt, they inhale more dirt. So, you know, I think we ought to consider at least being protective of these populations. So those are some things to think about. Um, not sure if any of you are planning to go into residential or commercial, but I just think it's a, it's a good thing to think about. Okay, especially if you are going to be a realtor, this is a good thing to be aware of. What is not included in the phase one? And the list is long. These are a few of them. Sometimes people will call us, this happened to us where we got a call, can you do a phase one for four apartment buildings that we own? So we went, we did the phase ones, and we, they only had a couple of weeks to get it done, so we really hustled. And the day before their funding application was due, they were reading our phase ones and they said, you didn't include radon or asbestos or lead paint or lead in drinking water. We said, well, that's not part of a phase one. And they said, okay, but we need it for our funding from the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Association. I think it's, I think the A's an association, but PHFA is requiring that. Well, they hadn't told us they were seeking lending from PHFA and we hadn't specifically told them asbestos, lead paint, et cetera, are not included in a phase one. So here we are, they're back up against the wall with funding applications having to go in in a day or two, not having the information that they needed. So it's really important to find out up front if there's funding involved that has extra requirements and communicate that to the consultant so they can make sure to get it done. Um, we did have a happy ending. We were actually able to get in there and get everything sampled and done before they had to get their application in and they passed and uh, I believe they got their funding. So it's all good, but it was uh, very stressful for everyone involved. Uh, let me just see if there's anything interesting here. That's all pretty technical. I don't think you guys probably care about the specifics of what's not included. If I'm wrong, you can unmute and ask. All right, then you go to phase two. I'm gonna gloss over this a little more because it's, it's harder to generalize about phase twos. So they're very site specific. Depending on what you find, like what type of contamination you find, that will drive what your phase two looks like. How big is the problem? That will drive your phase two uh, design. And, and also like the, the purpose of the sampling, the risk tolerance of your client, there's a lot that goes into determining the scope of a phase two. But basically what the consultant would do is they'll make recommendations in their phase one and say, you know, there's this tank here, I think you should investigate the tank. And then over here, there's this dead area of grass, I think we should investigate that. So then we would put together a proposal that says like, we think it'll take one day of drilling, we're gonna go out, we're gonna collect some samples from the dead grass, and we're gonna collect samples from around the tank. Around the tank, we're gonna analyze for petroleum because we know it was a heating oil tank. So we'll, we'll analyze the soil for petroleum. And then the, the dead circle, we don't know what it is. So we're gonna analyze for everything. So that's kind of how phase twos work. You, you come up with what the analysis will be based on what you're trying to get at, what you're trying to solve. The cost of those, oh, I, yeah, I should probably talk about cost. Phase ones typically range from about 2000 on up. I mean, if you have a huge chemical plant, it can be a $10,000 phase one. But they usually, I'm gonna say they start around 2000, two to three is kind of standard. A phase two, probably starts at 6,000, 
And boy, if you have to do groundwater and if you have to monitor it for years and years, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So a huge range there on how that turns out. And then after your phase two, after you have done the sampling, you've identified where your problems are and what needs to be remediated, you go in and do remediation. Again, it's very site specific. You can either do physical removal, like we talked about when we were looking at the pictures, which is removing a tank, digging and hauling the soil. You can do in situ bioremediation, which is where you inject bacterial solution into the contaminated area and the bacteria eat the contamination. Um, that only works for certain types of contamination. Uh, another type of remediation is long-term monitoring, which is, I think, only nominally remediation, but long-term monitoring is if you have contamination in groundwater and you say, well, we removed the source, like we removed the leaking tank and we know there's still some gasoline in the groundwater, but it's gonna go away eventually. So you agree to monitor it and just like test it every quarter until the numbers are low enough to meet the regulations. That's considered a remediation. Um, and then the last one on this slide is engineering and institutional controls, which is where you say, we know there's contamination, we're gonna leave it in place, but we're gonna control how much people are exposed to it. So engineering examples would be things like a cap. A cap is where you, you put something over the top of the soil. And typically this would be like a parking lot is a popular one. A building is also a cap for certain things. Um, you can put liners in under the soil to prevent contaminants from going out through the bottom. If it's a groundwater contamination, a pumping system or a treatment system would be considered an engineering control. So these are, as the name implies, things that probably need an engineer to sign off on them. And they're a physical system that will require maintenance on an ongoing basis. Usually annually, you're going to have to inspect it and make sure that it's still working. Institutional controls are the other piece of this, and those include things like deed restrictions, deed notices, municipal ordinances. So this is what I referred to earlier, where if I have contamination in groundwater, but everyone around my site is connected to the city water supply, I know nobody's drinking that water, so it's not actually harming anyone. So maybe I can leave it there, but I have to prove that that municipal ordinance is being enforced and I have to periodically make sure that it's still in place and it hasn't been changed. So engineering and institutional controls are frequently used in Pennsylvania, especially because of the way our regulations are written. They're a really popular choice. <clears throat> they encourage people to reuse brownfield sites. The, in fact, the way Pennsylvania regulations are written overall really encourage people to be able to use a site that might be a little bit contaminated and make it easier, less liability and less cost to reuse a site that might be contaminated. As opposed to like in New Jersey where they tend to make you clean everything up physically, you have to physically remove all the contamination. That tends to be very expensive and time consuming. And so people just say, I don't wanna reuse that former factory site. I'm gonna go to this farm field and build my factory there. So this is part of the whole brownfields thing that if we have time and if you're interested at the end, we can come back to the theory of brownfields and why they're important. Um, so if you're using engineering and institutional controls, a lot of times they're used together. You have both and you'll enter into what's called an environmental covenant, typically. Um, Pennsylvania has this, some other states have it, not every state, but the environmental covenant is basically a contract between you and the Department of Environmental Protection that says, we're gonna monitor this every year, we're gonna to report to you every year to make sure it's in place, and we're going to document it on the chain of title, right, on the deed, so that every person who buys this property in the future is aware that they have these obligations. The, this environmental covenants is kind of a new thing that came in the last 10 years, I'm gonna say, because what would happen was I would have a client, we would have a site, we'd say, okay, we're gonna cap it and you have to maintain the cap. Great, they're maintaining the cap. Then they sell it to the next guy and they say, oh, don't forget, you have to maintain the cap. Okay, got it. And then he goes to sell it and he forgets to tell the next guy that he's supposed to maintain it. And you, know, you get three or four 
people down the chain and they have no idea that the parking lot is supposed to be a cap that is protecting the soil underneath and they're no longer maintaining it. And so there were all these violations, a lot of them inadvertent, but people were not maintaining the environmental and engineering controls. So the covenant is just a mechanism to make sure that everyone who buys the property down the, down the road is on notice that they need to take care of it. Okay, environmental liability. Um, this is kind of the whole meat and potatoes of why do you care? Why, why do you care about doing a phase one or a phase two? And why do you have to deal with environmental consultants? So just to quickly go over some of the costs that can be involved with environmental, and they're worse if you aren't paying attention ahead of time and doing the due diligence. There's the cost of compliance, which is just the actual cost of doing your phase one, phase two, and remediation. If you are out of compliance, there might be penalties and fees from the regulatory agencies. And depending on what those are and how long you've been out of compliance, those can be quite expensive. There are legal costs. You can pay for lawyers to fight the Department of Environmental Protection. You can pay for lawyers to fight against third parties. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, maybe it's somebody who's working on the site and they're developing a rash that they never had and they're pretty sure it's because there's something in the soil they're working with. There could be lawsuits there and those can, you know, how legal costs can add up. Um, there can be, if you're doing a construction project and you haven't done your due diligence and suddenly you find a tank you didn't know was there. And uh, just as a bonus, let's say the excavator actually accidentally ruptures the tank. When they, they're digging, their bucket goes right through the tank and ruptures it and whoops, it was full of something and we don't even know what it is, but now it's everywhere. That causes a work stoppage. Now you have to stop a construction project to deal with that environmental problem and those work stoppages are very expensive and developers get very upset when that happens. Uh, just bad publicity and public relations, you know? If you, let's say you hit that tank, okay, now the tank has ruptured and let's say it's something really putrid smelling and everyone in the neighborhood now smells it and is gossiping about how dangerous and deadly your site is. That can be really deleterious to um, the project that you're working on, or God forbid, you're the one trying to sell the property and now everybody has this association with it that it's this terrible property. You really don't want that. Um, and then in some cases, this isn't every case, but I just wanted to bring up joint and several liability. And this is a concept, um, it's not just limited to environmental, but the idea of joint and several liability is Let's say everybody is contributing to a problem. I think the easiest way to think of it is like a landfill. Let's say there's a landfill and a bunch of people, everybody's sending their hazardous waste to this hazardous waste landfill. And one of the clients is ExxonMobil and they send all of their highly contaminated petroleum soil to this landfill. And then there's a mom and pop shop that one time had one little tank leak and they sent one truckload to the landfill, okay? So they contributed say 1% of what's in this landfill and Exxon contributed 99% of what's there. Joint and several liability means that if the cleanup for the hazards, now there's a problem down the road, there's contamination at this landfill. The EPA or the DEP puts a price tag on it. It's gonna cost $15 million to clean this up. Joint and several liability means they're going after Exxon for 15 million and they're also going after the mom and pop shop for 15 million. It doesn't matter that they contributed less. They are on the hook for the entire liability. So it's just, this is the kind of thing that keeps me up at night when clients say, well, I'm not sure I wanna spend $3,000, you know, doing this work. Like <laughs> you have to think big picture and long term. there may be liabilities you're not aware of. And that's part of my job is to educate our clients about these liabilities. So this is why buyers should do their environmental due diligence properly to try to get those protections. And as we discussed before, even if it's not like a super fun site, you're, you still wanna do the standard industry practice. So ways to mitigate the risk, do good due diligence. Do your phase one, 
if it's, if a phase two is recommended and you can always get a second opinion, you know, you may, may, may not want to do the phase two, get a second opinion, but don't be cheap on the investigation because doing the investigation is really cheap compared to defending a lawsuit. Um, hire reputable and experienced help. And this is the consultant, the lawyer, the realtor, anyone involved with this transaction and make sure that they're familiar with your geographic area. A, because they'll know what's going on in that area and B, because regulations are different from municipality to municipality, from county to county. You want someone who really knows what applies to your project site. And also make sure that they're familiar with specifically what you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with a huge chemical plant, you don't wanna work with a consultant that's only ever done gas stations. Um, you can get in environmental insurance. So for larger projects, getting insured can sometimes be a good answer. And you can also outsource some of your liability. So a lot of the projects that we work on, a developer wants to develop the property, but developers aren't eligible for grants. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar, the difference between a grant and a loan, a grant is free money. You don't have to pay it back. A loan, you have to pay back. In most environmental programs, grants are awarded to a municipality, but loans are awarded to private developers. So to access that grant money, you have a public-private partnership. The private developer goes to the city and says, you have this disgusting property right in the middle of your city, right next to the elementary school. I'll clean it up for you, but I can't do it. It doesn't make sense financially unless you get the grant to clean it up and then I will take over the property and develop it. And this, it actually works really well. It's kind of win-win. Um, some people complain about it and don't like, they feel like developers are getting free money to go make tons of dough. It, sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And especially on a Brownfields property, they may not make so much money because there's a lot of risk there. So we just worked on a project like this in Easton. Um, it's an old silk mill. It is right next to an elementary school. And they're putting in low income housing and some commercial. And the city of Easton maintained title to the property so that they got a grant and they did the remediation under the grant. And then the developer will come in with other funding to help them be able to afford putting in low income housing. So um, that's, a, I think, a really great example of how a public private partnership should work and, and can be win win because, in the end, the city will have affordable housing and they won't have. A, an eyesore and a dangerous site right in the middle of their city.